Alright guys, glad you were able to join us again for our continuing series we've been doing on systematic theology. Uh, we've been going through R.C. Sproul's book, uh, Everyone, a Theologian is the title of that book. So you can get that on Amazon. And um, one of the guys who was going to do some speaking for us today was not, uh, mom wasn't feeling well, so he just wasn't able to be with us. So we're going to have to kind of jump ahead a little bit in the, in the series, but he's actually going to come back and do his section, so um, we're going to kind of have to get off the order of the book, but I figured we would talk about Christology. Um, last time we... You may want to scoot over. Okay, you may want to scoot over. Um, we talked about the Trinity. There was a lot of questions that came up about uh, the person of Jesus, and how kind of that works, how he works it within the Trinity. And so today we're going to look at the doctrine of Christ and how we answer so many of the objections that come. This is the beautiful thing about this, guys. If you can get the doctrine of, of God the Son down, you will be able to weather the onslaught of assaults from Muslims, from Mormons, from Jehovah's Witnesses, from... Uh, United Pentecostals, UPC, uh, Oneness, is, you know, called Oneness Pentecostals. Um, if you go to our Rational Christian Winter Facebook or YouTube page, you can see a debate I did with a campus, another campus minister on this topic uh, last year. And so, it, this is really the center, one of the center uh, doctrine, central doctrines of Christianity. So, uh, I can't overestimate the importance. We talk about kind of essential versus non-essential or second or third order doctrinal issues so uh, for example you know pastor Ware, the, the lutheran guy here he would hold to like infant baptism i'm a baptist so I, I would say believer's baptism important differences but we're still brothers in christ right somebody that denies that jesus christ is god is like they're not our brothers and sisters in christ right we can say everybody is god's Creation, God created everybody, but not everybody is God's child, right? Because you have to be what? Born again. And if you don't have the right Jesus, and you're not trusting in the right Jesus, then you don't have the right gospel. Does that make sense? All right. I love some of the some of the beautiful artwork from the uh, Eastern or Greek or Russian Orthodox. They have some of the coolest, coolest pictures. All right. So here's an outline. We're going to look at. Jesus is God. We're going to look at Jesus in the Old Testament, Jesus in the New Testament, and then we'll very briefly examine uh, what's called the minimal facts argument for the resurrection. So, uh, a few different reasons why we would say Jesus is God. First, Jesus is the creator of the universe. Uh, if you can create the universe by default, that makes you God. <laughs> you create something from nothing, that's just everything we mean by God. That's all the signposts for God. Secondly, Jesus has the attributes of God. And third, we would say Jesus' miracles confirm that he is God. Jesus as creator. Where would you guys go to show that? John 8, 58. So that passage in, you have what's called the Greek Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And you have an example in Exodus chapter 3, while Moses is talking to God, this burning bush, and he says, who do I say sent me? And um, God responds, uh, I am that I am. And in the Greek, it's that word ego emi. So Jesus actually claims that title in several places in the New Testament. John 8, 58 is one of them, and uh, you know he's doing that because the response is they grab stones to stone him. Why? They're saying he's committing blasphemy by claiming uh, he's the son of God, making himself equal with God, John chapter 5, 18. You also see in John um, chapter 8, 24, it says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. All right? So, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great one to show the deity of Christ, What's the verse that shows Jesus is the creator? 
John 1, yeah, that's a great, great example. All right. Any others you guys can think of? So many with many, and we'll get to the scriptures, many would think Jesus comes into the existence at the incarnation. Basically, he didn't exist. I mean, he just, he comes to be through Mary at the incarnation. But Christian theology has always professed as one of the central doctrines that Jesus is fully God and equal with the Father. Now, Pastor Ware spent the last couple of weeks going on talking about the Reformation and some of the central doctrines of the Reformation. Uh, sola Scriptura. What is Sola Scriptura? You guys remember? Scripture. scripture alone. So, what do we mean by Scripture alone? Scriptures are guide. Okay. Scriptures are guide. Yeah. The reason this is important uh, is because. Uh, if you look at Roman Catholicism, if you look at Orthodoxy, they, they would say that uh, tradition is on equal par, and same with the councils, and etc. creeds, uh, would be on the same par as Scripture. So, as Protestants, we wouldn't say that, but my fear is this. A lot of times in the Protestant uh, community, and especially like the tradition I'm in as a Baptist, um, basically church history starts with Billy Graham. And uh, that's dangerous, right? God has given us church history. God has given us councils. God has given us confessions. God has given us creeds, right? Think of your parents. Your parents are authoritative over you as a child, right? Are they the ultimate authority? Are they God? Well, no. They're fallible. They can make errors. But they're still an authority. Think of this like church history, right? Um, the writers are not fallible or infallible. They can make errors. But church history is there for our benefit. The reason you get the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, um, what's some of the other ones? Um, there's one particular one I'm thinking of. I can't exactly remember the name. But Chalcedonian Creed. Um, the reason these creeds come up, come about is because in early in church history you have all these heretics showing up and they're saying. No, Jesus is not God. He's just a little lesser, lower God, like the Arians, right? Or, um, no, God is not three persons. He's just one person, and he just manifests himself in different forms. Modalism, right? So you have these confessions and these creeds that come together that are putting the doctrines that are already laid out in the scriptures together in a cohesive way so that there, there is a defense for the doctrines, right? The Bible... All the Bible is true, right? It's infallible, it's inspired, it's inerrant, but uh, it's not a systematic theology textbook, right? Um, so the, the job of the theologian, what, what we're doing in this class is looking at the different disciplines, Christology, soteriology, pneumatology, soteriology, all these things, and we're seeing how they, how they fit together, right? Kind of build this big picture. So this is one of the things that we're doing with Christ. We have to look at what the Bible says about the person of Jesus. Compare this with, okay, well, how many gods is there? What does the Bible say about how many gods there is? Um, the virgin birth, all these other things, the resurrection, and see how they fit together. And so church history is important. So when, it's saying, when I'm saying you know, Christian theology is always professed, yes, of course, the Bible has taught this, but also the church as a whole has held this, that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, he's not a created being, he is fully God and equal with the Father. It's a lesser authority than the scriptures, but it's still an authority. Uh, as we'll see, most of the other cults and world religions will deny the divinity of Jesus. So there are numerous biblical texts which teach that Jesus played a major role. This is one of the first ones uh, Scarlett brings up. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Who's the Him? Who's he talking about? The Word, right? And without Him, again, the Word, was not anything made that was made. In Him, the Word, was life. 
and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, if you pair this with John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? So it's very clear who it's speaking of here. It's speaking of Jesus. So all things were made through him, without and without him was not anything made that was made. So this idea that Jesus is not, sometimes people will say, yeah, you know, Jesus is uh, the Son of God. You know, I remember having a conversation with a guy at work one time, and I had used that phrase, Jesus is God the Son. And he says, well, no, he's not God the Son, he's the Son of God. And in his mind, because Jesus is the Son of God, therefore he's a lower, lesser being. That's not. That's not accurate at all. Okay? So, um, we go through the scriptures and we look at passages like these that tell us he's in the beginning with God. Everything is made through him. Without him, not anything was made. Scarlet, you've been with us a long time now, right? What is the Kalam cosmological argument? Right. Premise one, whatever begins to exist is a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Conclusion, therefore the universe has a cause. It's a deductive argument, right? So there you go. Well, cosmological argument. Colossians 1, 15 through 17, this is a very powerful one. He's the invisible, or he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So that there's a Greek word, there's two different Greek words that can be used. Okay? Jehovah's Witnesses will latch onto this. The guy I was debating latched onto this and tried to say, see, he's the firstborn of all creation. Well, there's a Greek word for first created and a, a Greek word for firstborn. It doesn't say Jesus is the first created. Firstborn is dealing with preeminence. Uh, I think it's Psalm 89 talks about David being the lastborn of, of uh, or the firstborn of Jesse. He's actually the lastborn biologically. So when it's saying firstborn here, it doesn't always mean biologically, right? There's a case in which it's talking about preeminence or shares the same uh, rulership or authority. For by him, again speaking of Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. Very important passage, right? So when it's saying he created all things, what does it mean? In heaven and earth. What does that mean? Created all things, right? Physical, stars, the sky, the galaxies, etc. Visible and invisible. What is that speaking of? What is the invisible? Are angels visible? Not unless God chooses to allow them, right? But in their being, they are invisible, right? Because they're not material beings. They're not made of matter. If you guys go, go to our show that we did Friday with my friend Shandon Guthrie, uh, he did his Ph.D. in demonology. It was a phenomenal show. And he, yeah, we, we get into basically all the metaphysics of angels. So, demons, Satan, etc. are what? Fallen. Fallen angels, right? So sometimes you hear this idea that Jesus and the devil are like fighting each other, right? And, you know, there's that one stupid meme where they're arm wrestling. Right? And it's like, type amen if you think Jesus is going to win. According to this passage, who created fallen, who, who created angels? Jesus, right? So that would include the fallen angels, right? Is Lucifer a fallen angel? Yes. Therefore, Jesus created Lucifer. Not to say that he created him as Lucifer, right? But I'm saying the being, his existence, etc., is derived from Christ, right? God holds him up, he sustains him, and, he, and if it wasn't for that, he would go out of existence. So don't buy into this idea that you know Satan and Jesus are kind of battling for um, control of the universe, right? God is completely sovereign, and he owns all things. He allows certain things, we talk about providence, etc., but 
there is no battle uh, between the devil and Jesus as far as um, you know who holds who and who exists. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days has spoken to us by his Son, who he appointed the heir of all things, for whom also he created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, who upholds the universe by the word of his power. Think about when you guys go on vacation. What are some of the places you guys go to? Charleston. Charleston. What's in Charleston? Historic city. Historic city. Okay. One of our favorite places to go during the uh, the break. And Thanksgiving is coming up. Go to the beach. Mm -hmm. We stay at the beach for a couple of weeks and. You're there and you're looking out there at night and you see the kind of the sea fog and the lights and hear the ocean, you smell the smells. Jesus created that. You know? We think about, you know, in, in times in our life when we're most impacted, is it when you are thinking or looking at yourself? I hope not. Or other things, right? You're at the Grand Canyon. You're in awe, you're in beauty, it's just like overwhelming. You're at the beach, you're at the waterfalls, you're, uh, you know, I remember one time in Oregon, we were at the beach, and nighttime, wasn't really paying much attention, and someone had said, you know, look up, and as you look up, it's just like, because everything was so dark, you, but in the sky, it's so bright, you see everything, you know. Those are things that inspire awe, and wonder, and magic, and it's not of ourselves, right? It's of the, of the Creator. So when you guys see these things, don't separate it. And I think that was, for me as a kid, it was never, those things were never tied together, right? So, um, you know, I remember my, my grandfather, he was, you know, we, me and him were very close, uh, but um, he was an atheist. He did, thankfully I was able to lead him to the Lord before he died. But growing up, I mean, you know, um, we would watch nature and all these kind of shows and it was just this atheistic naturalism that was drilled into your head and so you you separate the idea of this amazing creation and, cre and um, creatures from the creator right so we shouldn't do that as we see the creation as we see these things that just inspire us and just make us in awe how much more should it make us in awe of the Creator, right? You see a beautiful painting, very impressive painting. How much more impressive is the mind of, of the painter? So just remember that. I think we're going through uh, He is the Creator. So A.W. Tozer says, What comes to our minds when we think that God is the most important thing about us? Why do you think that is? Do you guys agree with that statement? What do you think, Becca? I think that, um, like, your relationship with God is the most important thing because it informs, like, everything about you. So, yeah, I think that whatever you think about being true of God will inform the way you think, the way you live your life, all of that. Yeah. Because a lot of times the way we act is going to be based upon what we believe, right? Yeah. What do you think? Charlotte, what do you think about it? Hey. I think, I agree with what you're saying, because, I mean, if you think about it, if you don't think that God exists, then that's going to inform your goals and your motives in life and, like, how you handle everything. Um, because, like, the way we, our, the way we view God makes up our world view significantly, because it Right. And you know, you could insert different things as being 
you go out there and then that will help you understand why people act the way they act and it could be like ultimately what they value the most because it could be themselves it could be relationships it could be you know, it can be anything yeah very good hopefully it was like you know the yeah, I mean, I think you guys picked up on it well. So he's not he's not saying, you know, people that don't believe in God um, are trash or something, right? Because we already know that people have value um, only because they're made in the image of God, right? That's all we even have value. But, yeah, it's, it's like you guys said, it's, it's how we how we live our lives. It's our worldview that goes right back to that. So when we talk about the attributes of God, uh, so the Muslim says uh, you believe Jesus is God. You believe Jesus is God. Can God die? Did Jesus die on the cross? Is Jesus God? And God can die. No, so he's pushing the contradictory. What would you say to that, Jay? I think he's reincarnated. Say that again? I think he's reincarnated, so that's also something that if he is a human, not a, a deity, then God, then he should come back. Okay. Okay. Can God die, Sherlock? So good. I tell you, Ben was up there. Uh, that's exactly it, right? There's two natures. Jesus has a divine nature. Jesus has a human nature. So we will absolutely affirm: No, the divine nature cannot die because the divine nature is God. God is what immutable. He can't change. It's unchanging. But the human nature is not immutable. The human nature does change. Look at the graph. So Jesus is human nature. He had a beginning. What do I mean? Well, he didn't always physically exist, right? What do we celebrate at Christmas? Incarnation. What about the divine nature? Well, we're told that the scriptures we just looked at, he's the creator. Space, time, and matter comes into being. So if space, time, and matter comes into being, he can't be made up of space, time, and matter, right? He's outside, above, and beyond space, time, and matter. He's what theologians would call transcendence. In his human nature, his, his knowledge is limited, right? Because So think of all these, this is what the Muslim can ask. Is Jesus God? Yeah, Jesus is God. Did he know the time of his, of his coming? Well, no, because he says you know, only the Father knows. Now, technically, Jesus isn't God. Jesus doesn't know all things, then he can't be God. Well, in the, the, in the human nature, he doesn't know all things. Why? Because he's finite, he's limited, he's dependent. But in the divine nature, of course he knows all things because he's omniscient. He knows all things. He knows everything there is to know. Is his power limited? Well, in the human nature or in the divine nature? In the human nature, yeah, his, his power is limited. Why? Because he's a human, he's contingent, he's finite. But in the divine nature, he's all powerful. So you see him bending the is it whenever he performs miracles and he can like say like to Philip when he walks up to him, oh, you are the fig tree, um, you're a true Israelite, he knows the ten people of hearts, like, is that his divine nature? Absolutely. Showing itself in the human. Remember he tells people, um, you know, at the table, he tells them who's going to betray him. The person dip, dips in after me. Now, is that the father giving him that knowledge? It's, I mean, it's debated, but I, I would say that I would say at certain times he uses access of the divine nature to know those things. Some some people would say it's it's um, the Father. Um, it's just that's somewhat of a debate, but he draws on that. Yeah. I've heard it explained one way as Jesus would sometimes like like he always had his divine nature, but sometimes he wouldn't like use it necessarily. Like when he 
said he touched me when the lady like touched the throat. So that was a genuine question. He wasn't saying yeah. it as if he knew already. Yeah. But had he wanted to, he could have said that. Yeah, well, a, a good example would be in the boat, right? When they're worried and it looks like it's going to get tossed and they're worried they're going to drown. And he's sleeping, right? Well, does God sleep? No, he doesn't. The Bible tells you God doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber, etc. But when they wake him up, he stands up and calms the storm, right? So you see that the, the human nature and the divine nature. So the point is, the main thing is, now how all that works, I don't know how that works, right? But the main point is, um, the, the human nature and the divine nature are separate, right? The persons aren't, it's still one person, it's one person, two natures, right? So we just want to maintain the divine nature doesn't change. Think of it with the incarnation. Don't think of it as subtraction. Like, <clears throat> oh, now he's 50% God. And, you know, no, think of it as addition, right? Now he's, he's added himself another nature. So he's added to himself a human nature. So there's not a loss. It's not a subtraction. It's an addition. Does that make sense? So that's, I'm telling you, that's how you answer all those objections that come from the Mormons, the Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses, all the, all the cults and all the world religions. That's what they latch on to. Uh, and so if you don't get out of anything else out of today, this is probably the most important thing you're going to get. Um, I think it's like interesting to think about how, so we always talk about how God couldn't make a uh, square Yeah. I mean, the way, the point isn't to explain, like, how that works, um, because that's no, not knowledge that we have access to, but we see, I think it's good to know that, like, the reason we say these things is because the scripture shows it happening. Yeah. So, like, but also, I would say it's not contradictory. So, if I said exactly. Jesus is fully divine and fully human in the same nature, that would be contradictory. But that's not the claim claim is he has a human nature and he has a divine nature. Now someone might say, that's confusing or I don't understand that. Okay. But it's not a contradiction. Right? You'd have to show why is it a logical contradiction for somebody to have a human nature and a divine nature. Right? What would you say to that? Put on your skeptic hat and feel free to give me a push back. Wait, wait, wait. What was the question? Well, because you, you, you said that um, you could see how someone would say it was contradictory. And right. so what the Christian, what we would claim is Jesus having, Jesus having a human nature and Jesus having a divine nature, we may not fully understand how that works, but there's no contradiction in that. Okay. Like, what would be the logical call? Like, um, is it violating the law of non, you know, non-contradiction? Is it violating the law of exclusive the middle? Is it, you know, like... They would have to show exactly what law of logic is being violated. In there. So, like, I guess it would just be what you would say is the law of non-contradiction. So, like, we have the beginning and then eternal, but uh-huh. we're the beginning at the same time. Right. So, it would be contradictory if I said his human nature had a beginning and his human nature was eternal. But that's not the claim. The claim is his human nature has a beginning. His divine nature does not have a beginning. It has to be, in order to be a contradiction, it's got to be in the same sense, right? Right, so like the question would then be like, if he's one being, how does he have two natures without it being contradictory? He's one person, not one being. One, one person, two natures. So you'd have to show, why is it a logical contradiction for somebody to have two natures in one person? Why is that though? I mean, why is why is that? It's our experience. Right, but that's not a law of logic, right? In our experience, a person can't jump from here to the moon. But it's not a law. It's not against the laws of logic to say somebody could jump from here to the moon. It might be physically impossible or not something that fits in our experience. 
But the point is, there's no law of logic that says um, you can only, uh, a person can't have more than one nature, right? So what if there's two natures do different things? They do do different things. Well, one's finite contingent, one is God. Why would you say that's not contradictory? Because it's not in the same, because they're not doing the things like the example you give of having a beginning and not having a beginning. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying Jesus has a beginning. We're saying the human nature has a beginning. Jesus has existed for eternity. Yeah. Right. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's just something that I was like. No, that's good. How do you good. like it? Because it's a lot of like word choosing. And, and it's, it's that way for a reason, to avoid contradiction, right? Logic and philosophy and that is important because it, it makes you have to drill down on very precise language. So I get it. It's hard. We don't understand it. But that goes, um, as, as my professor, Dr. Geiser, would say, there's a difference between going against reason and going beyond reason. So we could say that goes beyond reason. I don't fully understand that. But the skeptic's claim is, no, that's contradictory. And if something's contradictory, it can't be true. So if that's the case, then it's up for the skeptic to demonstrate where is the contradiction. And say, well, I've never, we just, in our experience, we don't know of a person who has two, you know, two natures. Fair enough, but that's not a logical contradiction. And if right. you're God, there's your, there's your example. That's interesting. Yeah. So, like, just because, like, it's hard for the human brain to understand something that we haven't experienced. That's why we use metaphors to understand God, like, anthropomorphism. Yeah. Like yep. But that doesn't mean that it's not true. Right. And so when we use these words, you know, for example, against the laws of logic, I'm not talking about does that make sense to you or can you fully grasp that? Mm -hmm. What the philosopher means by that is what law of logic is being violated? You know, is it the law of non-contradiction, law of excluded middle, law of identity, right? One of these things have to be true. So like you brought up earlier, we would say God cannot create a square rock or a married bachelor or a one-ended stick or something like that, right? Like, um, those things are logically impossible. God can do that which is logically possible because the laws of logic flow from his nature. So when these attacks come against the Trinity and against um, the person of Jesus, that's where they have, they have to show where there's a logical contradiction, not just, oh, it doesn't make sense, because you can turn it right back on the Muslim. The Muslim thinks God, is, God knows everything, right? How do you know, Mr. Muslim? How, how, how does God know everything? Explain that to us. They can't, because they're going to say, well, he's transcendent. He's majestic. We can't fully understand it. Okay, then. Just because you can't fully understand it doesn't mean it's a contradiction. Right. Make sense? Any other thoughts on that? All right, so some of the miracles of Jesus. Um, so first, get, get to what is the definition of a miracle? You say a miracle is a special act of God that interrupts the natural course of events. So it's not like, you know, oh, so-and-so had a baby. That's a miracle. Speaking of so-and-so had a baby, John Tasia had her baby. I was wondering about that. Yep, How wanna, is she? I gotta go. Uh, she's good. Yep, the baby looks looking great. Right. I gotta, got some stuff I gotta take over to her yeah, after this. It's a girl. Oh, man. Can't remember. Marley. <laughs> Marley, that's it. Right. Yeah. When she was she born? She is so happy. Man, I want to say she called my wife like last Thursday or something, I think, and her water broke. Oh, that's so she is, exciting. She is really excited. So she is happy as can be. So, yeah, we don't want to say a miracle is something like babies being born. That, that is a great, <laughs> that's a great gift and stuff, but it's not a miracle. Uh, the Christian conception of the miraculous, the way we're using it here, the way theologians would use it, immediately depends on the existence of a theistic God, right? A special act of God that interrupts the natural course of acts of events. If you don't have a God that can act, then you can't have acts of God, right? You can't have miracles. If the theistic God exists, the miracles are possible. Uh, and we would say not only are they possible, but they're, they're actual, because the greatest miracle, creation ex nihilo, has already happened. If God can create the universe from nothing, is it possible that he raises someone from the dead? Yeah. That doesn't mean every miracle claim is true just because he did a miracle, but it, 
It does mean uh, the naturalist who says miracles are not possible. No, they are more than possible. They're actual because you have creation, so you have to put them on the table and look at them. Um, if there is a God who can act, then there can be acts of God. The only way to show that miracles are impossible would be what? Got to disprove the existence of God. How could you disprove the existence of God? How would you go about it? The Christian God, I'll say that. Can it be done? It hasn't been done yet, but could it be done? Could it, in principle, be done? Um, I'm going to say it's true, but if, if humans were to actually create life in the dust, that would be the only way. If, if, humans, if humans did what? If humans could actually create a living existence. Well, no, well, no, they couldn't do that because uh, these materials could create that. Well, and, uh, you know, the, the naturalist view is life came into existence by chance, right? Yeah. So if a bunch of scientists get together and create life, that actually proves intelligent design, right? Mm -hmm. It takes a bunch of smart people to <laughs> create life. <laughs> it didn't happen <laughs> randomly. <laughs> there but could be a way. If you were able to prove that, it's really hard because, like, you could go down so many rabbit holes, you know? So, like, without trying to do that, but if you were able to Take the Christian God. How yeah, would you how like, could you disprove the Christian God? If well, the universe if you could prove that the universe came to exist without an initial cause, that would get rid of God. Right? So like his eternal like Well now you, you realize like Big Bang cosmology just came on the scene in the forties, right? Like the major the 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 majority view was that the universe was eternal. Even Aquinas and some of the Christian philosophers would grant, okay, the universe is eternal, but it still requires a, it still requires someone that is basically upholding its existence. So they would say, even if the universe was eternal, grant, we'll grant that. There's still philosophical arguments as to why it would still need a cause. Yeah, it just becomes stronger whenever you realize that there's, uh, yeah. what's it called, where it's like energy's running out? Second law, yeah. Yeah, Coming so you have to so there is ways to show that the... Go ahead. I was going to say, the only way you could disprove the Christian God is you'd have to disprove Jesus' resurrection. That would, de that, would, that, that, could, that would definitely take down the Christian God. How would you show... How would you disprove the resurrection? I personally think that you can't, but you would have to... Because there's like, you know, theories like the hallucination theory where like they were hallucinated you can't, group has, hallucinations can't happen. So, you know, there's, yeah, I just say like for each, and then there's ones that's like the. So would you guys say that, so basically you guys say you believe in a God that can't be proven false? Yeah. That's not good. It's not a good position to be in. Well, I mean. Because the basically there's nothing that could, there's nothing that could show you were wrong. Well, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> Okay, so, but the Bible says, like, Paul says at one point, like, if, like, we were to be proven wrong, we should be people that should be right. correct. Right, yep. So I'm not saying theoretically you couldn't. I was more saying... How would you? How could you show that the resurrection didn't happen? Real easy. If you had a body, right? Yep, that's it. Archaeologists have, find bone boxes all the time, ossuaries, right? Mm -hmm. That's how they can uh, determine all these his particular historic people that lived in the time. Find the bones. You know, find the bones of Jesus. That's one way. Another way would be demonstrate the attributes of God are logically contradictory. If omniscience and omnipotence and love and justice, if these things are somehow logically contradictory, then God cannot exist. Because not even God can make a contradiction true. Right? So there is ways. There is ways to falsify it. We, I, I think that's a good thing. Right? We don't want to just have something that could never, in principle, be shown wrong. There are ways. It's never been done, and I don't think it's ever going to be done, but there are ways it could happen, right? So, um, the only way to show that miracles are impossible is to disprove the existence of God. That's, that's the job of the skeptic. If they're going to, that doesn't mean you have to accept every miracle claim, 
because a lot of religions have miracle claims, right? But if you look at something like the resurrection, as we'll see, there's a lot of reliable, good eyewitness testimony and good evidence that supports it, not just, you know, um, there's a lot of scant uh, miracle claims out there with no evidence, right? What's the purpose of miracles? Uh, the prophets, Jesus, and the apostles performed miracles to authenticate that they were men of God and that their message was from God. So they're not just doing the miracles just to make people go, wow, right? No, they're, they're doing these miracles to show that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Remember, he says over and over, you don't believe the words that I say, believe the works that I do, right? He's offering evidence for, for who he is. Miracles, by definition, are not something that ordinary humans can perform apart from a supernatural, uh, that is above nature, act of God. So Jesus himself points to the works that he did. Um, John 10, 38, I do his works, believe in the evidence of the miraculous works that I have done. Even if you don't believe me, then you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. You have a lot of people today that claim that they are God or prophet, etc. Right? So with these particular people, you challenge them. Do a miracle. Right? We're not talking a magic trick. We're not talking sleight of hand. We're talking a real miracle. We are actually um, you know, reversing the <laughs> natural order. You don't see that. Um, you see even people in the Christian faith claim that they're able to do all these kind of miracles, etc. Benny Hinn. Um, go, to, go to the Children's Hospital, right? Go to, go to these places and uh, heal everybody if that's your claim. If they don't, so Jesus did. The virgin birth uh, would be a miracle. Changing the water into wine. Healing of the royal official son. Uh, healing of the possessed man in Capernaum. That's a very remarkable story. Catching a large number of fish. Uh, healing a leper. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus. Of course, the greatest miracle, we say, is his creation. He didn't create the universe from nothing, by nothing. Those things are, are, are uh, definitely easily possible. So let's look a little bit about Jesus in the Old Testament. Where do we first see Christ in the Old Testament? Well, it goes back to this question of uh, what is a theophany or a Christophany, right? Theophany is a manifestation of God in the Bible that is tangible to the human senses. In its most restrictive sense, it is a visible appearance of God in the Old Testament period, often but not always in the human, human form. So, some of the theophanies that you have. Genesis chapter 12, 7 to 9, the Lord appeared to Abraham on his arrival in the land uh, God had promised to him and his descendants. Genesis 18, 1 to 33, one day Abraham had some visitors, two angels, and God himself. He invited them to come to his home, and he and Sarah entertained them. Many commentators believe this could also be a Christoph, or uh, what's called a pre-incarnate uh, Christ, or appearance of Christ, uh, where Jacob wrestled with God, Genesis 32, 22 through 30. Um, so Jacob uh, wrestled with him, what appeared to be man, but was actually God. Uh, this also may have been a Christ often. Talk about the burning bush. Right, Exodus 3 through 417, he appears to Moses, uh, telling him exactly what he wanted him to do. God appears to Moses with Aaron and his sons and the 70 elders, Exodus 24, Deuteronomy 31, 14 and 15. God appeared to Moses and Joshua in the transfer of the leadership to Joshua. Job 38 through 42, God answers Job out of the tempest and spoke at great length uh, in answer to Job's question. So, a lot of commentators, a lot of theologians believe these were good examples of a theophany or a pre-incarnate Christ. So that's you know just something to consider. And definitely, you have Jesus being prophesied numerous times in the Old Testament. You have a lot of the Psalms, Psalm 22, for example, uh, talks about uh, his crucifixion. If you ever read that Psalm, talking about his 
uh, you know, pierced his hands and his feet, his bo bones being out of joint, people mocking him, and etc. Uh, years before the or before the crucifixion was even invented. So uh, numerous prophecies in the Old Testament of Jesus. Um, for example, that he'd be born of a woman. Genesis 3.15, sometimes called the Proto-Evangel or the first uh, gospel. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. The Messiah would be born of a virgin. The Messiah would come from the line of Abraham. These are very specific prophecies, guys. These aren't just kind of Nostradamus or vague. Something great will happen this year. <laughs> These are like very drilled down. The Messiah would be descendant of Isaac. The Messiah would be a descendant of Jacob. So you see where they're at. You know, it's very um, specific prophecies. They're not these vague things, visits the temple, dies the city community, the sacrifice, sacrifice. So of course see Jesus in the New Testament, we looked at John chapter one, verse two four. John five eighteen, for this reason the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And some say, Well, where in the Bible does Jesus claim to be God? I mean, it's all over, but that's a perfect example right there. John 8, 58, um, Faith brought up, Holy Ground was born, I am. Thomas confessed, right, uh, after he sees him. Uh, to the contrary, uh, you know, Jesus doesn't rebuke him, but he's questioning, you know, uh, unless I can put my hand in his wrist and his side, I'm not going to believe it. Touches him, he sees, well, it actually text didn't say he touched him, he just sees his feet, you know, he sees him, and in John 20, 48, Thomas responds with my Lord and my God. So a person needs to confess Jesus as the Lord, that is, Yahweh, Jehovah, is the divine name for God, Romans 9, 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Titus 2, 13 waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. How much more clear can it be? Right? It's very frustrating when you're meeting with Jehovah's Witnesses and that. Me and Melissa met with a couple older men. I think it was almost two years. And it's like the blindness. Utterly blinded. Second Peter 1.1 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant an apostle of Jesus Christ and those who have stayed the faith and people standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Very clear. Real quick, as we end here with the minimal facts argument. Got a whole talk on this Mike gave on our YouTube channel, so if you want more on that, feel free to check that. This message considers only those data that are so strongly attested historically that they are granted by nearly every scholar who studies the subject, even the rather skeptical ones. It should be noticed that this approach does not assume the inerrancy or divine inspiration of the New Testament, rather it merely holds these writings to be historical documents. So it's not saying for this argument to work, you have to assume that the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God. Nope, just saying, treat it like a, a historical document. So these are 12 minimal facts. So we're, when we're talking about these, are, we're talking very high uh, from like the 1960s or so up to the present day of German, French, and English spelled. If you have to go early, you can. Oh, okay. I do have to leave at like 12. Okay, okay. I'm going to show you um, So these are some of these, uh, some, of the, some of the facts. That, that they all would agree to. Jesus dies by crucifixion, he's buried, his death caused the disciples to despair and lose hope, the tomb's empty, disciples had experiences which they believed to be the risen Lord, disciples were transformed from doubters to bold proclaimers, again, atheists, skeptics, etc. Uh, agree with these. The resurrection was their central message, they preached the message of Jesus' resurrection in Jerusalem, uh, the church was born and grew, Orthodox Jews who believed in Christ made Sunday their primary day of worship, changing it. Uh, James, who was the brother of Jesus, was converted, and Paul was converted. Very strong uh, facts here. 
We'll only look at six of these facts. Uh, the strength of the approach, again, this does not assume the Bible is in there. No, the Bible has 66 books, right? So when you talk about the Bible, I'm talking one book. 66 books made up of, like, you know, uh, 60, 66 authors written over 1,500 years. So it's not just a book. So it's looking at the particular doc documents and looking through, uh, using abductive reasoning to show that the resurrection is the best explanation for the person of Jesus of Nazareth. What is abductive reasoning? Glad you asked. It is a form of logical inference which starts with an observation or set of observations then seeks to find the simplest and most likely explanation. In abductive reasoning, unlike in deductive uh, reasoning, the premises do not guarantee the conclusion, but one can understand abductive reasoning as an inference to the best explanation. So here we go. First of all, Jesus died by crucifixion. Second, his tomb was found empty. Third, the disciples believed and preached he's risen. Four, Paul the church persecutor was converted. Five, James the skeptic was converted. Six, the empty tomb. These are very strong uh, facts, right? So in order for a naturalistic view to work, they've got to somehow explain what do you do with these particular facts. So conspiracy theory, um, this objection claims that the disciples all conspired to steal the body and trick everybody into thinking Jesus had rose from the dead, but in reality he didn't. They claim the disciples stole the body in order to pull this off. What is the problem with conspiracy theory? Well, first, how did the disciples take on a group of Roman guards whose lives were on the line if anything happened to the body? Second, how did the disciples end up moving a two-ton stone away from the tomb after supposedly dismantling an army of friend killers? Three, why would they steal the body? They gained nothing but ridicule, mockery, and many died at the hands of the not repairing the faith. We know from church history, yes, you know, five of them were murdered for their faith. So you generally, you know, there has to be some motives uh, to do this, right? Um, people normally don't die for what they know is a lie. People die for what they may believe is true. But if the disciples stole the body, then they would know he didn't rise from the dead, right? The spirit also doesn't explain the other minimal facts. Um, again, why why do you die for a lie? Too. It doesn't count for the aversion of Paul or James, false skeptic, right? So those are facts that, that uh, have to be explained. That particular conspiracy theory doesn't account for it, too. Hallucination theory. Uh, this theory believes uh, the disciples did not actually see Jesus, but were in a state of grief. So it's sometimes called grief hallucinations. They were having uh, these hallucinations, and on this view, the disciples were not lying, but simply in a state of grief. And hallucinate. So, you know, you lose lose a person and then you know, so you have these hallucinations and that's what the disciples were doing. A lot of problems with this theory. First of all, over 500 people were told saw him at the same time. So, unless we're going to believe that 500 people all were having mass hallucinations of Jesus, grief hallucinations, the disciples saw him eating, drinking, touch them, Think about this. Hallucinations do not hallucinations do not happen in groups where everybody's having the same hallucination. Imagine I came in and said, "Man, didn't we have a great dream last night?" You know, we all dream different things. You all have your, your own different hallucinations. This is just, uh, you know, uh, with the medical like the DSM really demonstrates you don't have these mass hallucinations. Doesn't explain the empty tomb doesn't explain the conversion of Paul, and it doesn't explain, explain the conversion of James. Both Paul and James are skeptics. Why are they having grief hallucinations of Jesus, right? Because you got to go. Do we need to be out? We're good till 12.30. Okay, okay. I just want to make you aware. You need to go. I'll probably be there after I'm okay. 12.30, but That's I right. want to say with like, the hallucination thing, I think it's so interesting because that plays into the eyewitness testimony like why people trust him because our brains like we all perceive things differently but they all right. came to the same conclusions even though they weren't like necessarily like that was their first assumption right yep awesome thank you Cheryl
Yeah, so those are those are some of your issues there with the hallucination. And if you guys have questions about it, I mean, feel free. If you agree or don't agree, feel free to give me some pushback. So the hallucination theory is one of the most popular ones. If you guys want to see a great debate on this, the one that actually converted me, I grew up in a Christian home, but I've never been given like really good answers or reasons to believe Christianity is true. I'm flipping through the channels one night, I was 23, I was drunk, and it was around Easter time, and this debate between John a or, uh, on John Ankerberg's channel, between Gary Habermas and Anthony Flew, it's still on YouTube today, this hour and a half debate on did Jesus rise from the dead. They're both, both just sitting in chairs and they're just sitting and talking. Anthony Flew is like the foremost philosophical atheist at the time, he actually became a deist before he died, and abandoned atheism, but, I mean, it was like, it was the best debate I, I'd ever seen on it, and at the end of that debate, I was on my knees, and like, had completely given my life to Christ, and everything changed, so he got to me. This was the primary argument Anthony Flew went with, was this uh, hallucination problem, and Gary, Gary had a mess with Anthony Lawrence. Four, swoon theory, that Christ didn't die, he only fainted. Well, Roman guards were trained to kill, and if they did not do their job, it would cost them their own lives. They would be, they themselves would be put to death if they didn't do the job properly. Secondly, it goes against the historical evidence that Jesus died on the cross. Who's heard of Bart Ehrman in here? Anybody heard of Bart Ehrman? New Testament scholar, Chapel Hill. One of the probably most popular skeptics uh, there is. He went to Moody Bible Institute. He went to Wheaton. He sat alongside the, uh, Bruce Metzger and F.F. F. Bruce and uh, eventually walked away from the Christian faith and is a radical skeptic uh, but has written books kind of trying to get his uh, other atheist compadres to stop making ridiculous claims like Jesus never existed or that he didn't die by the cross or didn't die on the cross. So even someone as radical as Bart Ehrman grants all these particular facts and everything. Third, it doesn't explain why the disciples believed and were willing to die, right? So, uh, uh, so if Jesus didn't really die, the swoon theory is he didn't really die on the cross, he just fainted and he comes back to life. Well, why would the disciples be uh, believe that he did die and, and be willing to give their life for that belief, right? Uh, four, it wouldn't explain the conversion of Paul and it wouldn't explain the conversion of James. Why? Well, because if you know anything about crucifixion, it's a brutal, 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 brutal practice, right? You have your median nerves here, so, and then your feet. So as you have these spikes go through it, right, you're going to lose your, your feeling in your arms, your legs. There's one person who was ever brought down mid-crucifixion, survived for, I think, a couple of hours, and then died. So this is talking Jesus was scourged, right? The awful beating with the whip, etc. Um, crucified. And so the, the point is this. Paul and James, after they see Jesus go through this, they're not going to be like, oh, wow, you know, that's, I want a body just like his. You know, I, he's obviously been resurrected. No, they would be, get this man to the doctor. Get him some help. So it's obviously not going to convince Paul and James that he was resurrected. And in conclusion, God raising Jesus from the dead is the best explanation of all the facts, and it's simply, uh, it's simply uh, the simplest explanation, right? To claim that 500 people all have the same mass hallucination, um, etc., and then as you look, you know, the, the swoon theory, and, and it, it's one of these things where it's a lot more simpler to just say God raised Jesus from the dead than having you know everybody running around with the same hallucination, which <laughs> which it never happens, and you know, etc. Second, many many have never heard the historical case for the resurrection and have no idea how powerful uh, a case that it is. Third, Christianity is a religion whose central events happen in space time. There's a plethora of historical evidence to support this, um, and also the resurrection is the cornerstone of the faith. Without it, there is no Christian faith. So. The reason we go through the minimal facts is um, because, again, that really is the kind of the demonstrates who Jesus claimed to be, right? 
destroy this temple in three days, John 2, 19, and in three days I'll raise it up. Okay, it took us 86 years to build the temple. Are you going to raise it up in three days? No. Talking about the temple of his body. Right? So, the resurrection is proof positive he is who he claimed to be. Any questions? Thoughts? Author of book, it was a uh, half forgot his name, but uh, he was, I think, I think he's from New Zealand. There might be some New Zealand or Australia type thing. Anyway, he was a uh, historical, he looked like a historical, he's also a Christian, he was with the historical uh, fact that of Jesus. And he, he even mentioned, I thought it was interesting, that I today they believe during the day he was actually uh, crucified. There was some kind of like blockage of the sun. That That's day. right, yeah. Yep. Kind of There's that. historians that talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you guys want more on it, um, Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona are like the two experts on it. They wrote a book called The Historical Jesus, and then they wrote another book called The Case for the Resurrection. And again, what, what's nice about this model is, uh, or this method is, it's not assuming that the Bible is inspired. You don't even have to hold that it is. It's looking at those facts that we all looked at that the skeptics, something like over 75%, we're not just talking Christians, but that they would, they would hold those particular facts and say that um, so those, are your fa those are your facts, and then how that data is interpreted, right, that's going to depend upon the worldview, but, you know, even the atheist says the disciples had experiences that they believed to be written Jesus. So the atheist might say, well, it wasn't really Jesus that they were having, you know, experiences with, but they believed that it was. So that's where you have to drill down to. Okay, well then, what explains that? Why were they? Ha why were they think? What? What was it instead? Right. So, any thoughts, the priests? Ah, right. well, we will be back at it again next week. Appreciate you guys.